Thank you, Nancy, um, for that introduction. And I, I want to echo Nancy's thanks to everyone for, for making time in, in their schedules to be here today. Uh, I think it's really wonderful to have such a distinguished group here today to, to talk about these vital issues. And, and when I think about um, you know, where we are today in our energy systems and thinking about sustainability um, going forward, you know, it's really about technology, it's about policy, and it's about finance. And finance is a, is a critical leg of that stool in getting from where we are today in our energy system and, and where we need to be 5, 10, 20, 30 years from now. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the policy side from our perspective, some of the major things that we have um, underway in the climate and energy space. Uh, and then I'll return to the end uh, to the, the finance part of it, and I'll be very brief in doing all of this. So last June, the President put out a climate plan, as Nancy indicated, and I'm going to focus on the, the mitigation side of that, the, the parts aimed at reducing pollution. The major initiatives there include uh, the first ever carbon standards for new and existing power plants. The EPA proposed standards for new power plants last fall uh, and is in the process of developing standards for existing power plants. The range of things in the energy efficiency space underway at the Department of Energy. Uh, there we, we committed in the plan to do another round of fuel economy and greenhouse gas standards for heavy duty vehicles, uh, EPA and Department of Transportation, um, as well as commitments to address emissions of methane and HFCs um, through a variety of mechanisms. So I think in the, in the policy space, we are making uh, use of the tools that, that we have as an administration to continue to ratchet down uh, emissions here at home. At the same time, we're taking a variety of steps to better prepare uh, as a federal government and in partnership with state and local communities for the impacts that we know that we're already seeing and that we know are, are coming. In, in 2012, uh, weather-related disasters cost more than $110 billion in the U.S. We know that we're facing serious impacts today as well. And so I think we, we're doing what we can on the policy side, and clearly the policy framework is key to shaping the, the investment environment. Uh, but I think we're also interested, so we want to have a good dialogue there, but we're also interested in thinking about other ways and, and other ways that we can partner with you to integrate uh, the kinds of climate and sustainability considerations into finance. So I think really looking forward to being part of discussions today. And with that, I will wrap up my brief remarks. And I'm very pleased to introduce uh, John Podesta, who's with us this morning. I think, as you all know, John joined the White House last week as a counselor to the president uh, after having um, co-founded uh, and served as president and CEO of the Center for American Progress uh, after a tour of duty under President Clinton as the White House chief of staff. So please join me in welcoming John. Uh, thanks, Dan. And uh, I wanted to be here this morning uh, to demonstrate one of two possibilities, uh, either that working on climate uh, and energy in the White House is a very dangerous occupation, <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, or uh, more importantly, to say how important I think this dialogue and discussion is. Uh, the President asked me to return to the White House, uh, and I, as Dan noted, I did just last week to work with, uh, with Dan and Nancy and the whole cabinet team to both ensure the implementation of the climate action plan that you heard about and to push forward uh, with uh, great vigor to transform our economy of uh, one that's inefficient, high carbon base to one that's uh, low carbon base and, and uh, is building uh, sustainability and to do it uh, with the resolve that we have to build more resilience into the economy. Uh, overall, so I was uh, happy to come back and, uh, amongst other things, uh, really uh, take uh, a leadership role uh, on that. And looking around the room, I feel like I made the right choice because we're going to get the job done. So uh, you're, there's an amazing group of leaders here uh, in climate finance, both speaking and, and, and in an attendance. You're the trailblazer, so it's, it's important for us, I think, to hear from you as much as for us to hear uh, from us. Uh, and um, I think I, I just make a couple of points. One is that uh, climate change finance, finance, as you all know, but I think needs to be more well known, uh, is not just part of corporate social re responsibility, uh, but actually mainstreamed uh, into the finance sector. Uh, uh, Kyung Ah Park is here, who's a uh, colleague of uh, Abby Joseph Cohen's 
And uh, Abby, I guess, got a little bit banged up on the way to the show as well. Uh, but I, I remember uh, Abby's work more than a decade ago uh, that uh, demonstrated that managing energy sustainability and climate change was not just uh, an indicia of being a good person, but was really an indicia of being great managers uh, and great companies. And it didn't matter what uh, sector of the economy you were talking about, whether it was in in the cleanest sectors or the dirtiest sectors, the responsibility to take a look at that uh, was going to be a strong indicator of strong management uh, inside the company. So I think it's good news for sustainability and for, more importantly, I think for the economy overall that uh, the re recent report of the cl uh, Carbon Disclosure po Project found that companies from the S&P 500 on the 2013 Climate Performance Leadership in Index more than doubled in 2012. People are paying attention to this uh, and it demonstrating the significance of incorporating climate change risk and opportunities into their overall business strategies. Uh, President, obviously, as Dan noted, understands that you can't tackle uh, climate change uh, alone. We need the uh, robust participation of the private sector, as Nancy noted, and we have strong partnerships in biofuels uh, in, uh, <clears throat> on HFCs, as, as was noted, uh, working with the insurance industry uh, to identify best practices. I think those examples uh, and more show the critical role the private sector plays uh, in partnering with, with the government. Um, and I think that's especially true with the finance sector, which is why this is such an important uh, uh, meeting uh, today. Um, I want to speak just a minute about the international context uh, because uh, you'll hear later from Dr. Ishii, from Elizabeth and others. But uh, it's really, I think, uh, the U.S. has contributed $7.5 billion uh, in the fast-track finance commitment uh, that was made at the Copenhagen Accord, but that's on the way towards a 2020 commitment, which was announced uh, in Copenhagen, of $100 billion a year uh, going to uh, uh, clean energy uh, finance. Uh, so move... Moving forward, we really need to think about how do we ramp up to that level of investment, uh, both not just from a national perspective, from, from a global perspective. Um, I won't steal their thunder. They'll tell us how to do it. But, but I think that is uh, a, uh, a global challenge of the first order of magnitude. And I want to conclude by saying that I just had the honor uh, of serving on Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's high-level panel on the post-2015 development agenda to think about and look towards uh, what uh, uh, is going to follow the Millennium Development Goals uh, and how we really end extreme poverty uh, globally uh, by 2030. Uh, and uh, I think that report, which was well-received and uh, uh, co-sponsored, uh, co-chaired by the uh, Prime Minister of the UK by Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and the President of Indonesia uh, really nested the, the uh, ideas around eliminating extreme poverty in the vision of building sustainable economies. Economies that were resilient, particularly for the poor, uh, in uh, economies that connected the poor to modern uh, to the modern economy, particularly in uh, information, telecommunications, and energy, uh, education, and healthcare. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to have to mobilize uh, what our secretariat uh, looked uh, to uh, be uh, at a trillion dollar level by 2030. And that's going to come from the private sector through public-private partnerships, through concentration on building the right kind of systems. And it's really, I think, up to you to give us ideas about how you can reach that level of ambition which the President <clears throat> in last year's State of the Union announced the goal of ending extreme poverty by 2030. That's going to take uh, a, a, a lot of effort to change uh, current systems, but I, I think, I believe that we're up to it uh, and we can build a, a cleaner, more sustainable world and one that's uh, filled with more justice as well. So thank you for letting me be here. Thank you, Mr. Podesta. Now I'd like to invite Ambassador Kathy Russell to the podium, who is the U.S. Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues and is advancing the interests of women throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley. <clears throat> I appreciate it. 
It's nice to be here. It's nice to be back in the White House. I am at the State Department now, but I was at the White House um, fairly recently. I was Dr. Biden's chief of staff, so it's nice to be back. And it's especially nice to see John here. I worked with John the first time about 25 years ago, not to age me or John for that matter, <laughs> but it's really great to see him here. Um, I, I am I'm really excited to be here and to see all of you uh, working on such an important issue. Um, all of us are here because we recognize a very basic fact that women really are critical to solving the immense um, global climate challenge and energy challenges we all face. I'm excited to have joined the State Department at a time when women and climate change issues are gaining momentum internationally. In fact, in, due, in part due to strong leadership um, by the United States, particularly by Todd Stern, who John and I have both worked with in the past as well, by Secretary Kerry, by Secretary Clinton, uh, gender is now a standing agenda item at the International Climate Talks, which I think is incredibly important. Women at all levels are and will continue to be at the front lines of climate, yes, I'm not John, uh, climate change and energy access solutions. Um, let me start by mentioning some interesting research on women and climate solutions at the corporate level. Studies indicate that adding women to higher positions in the private sector can result in a company's greater focus on longer term sustainability. Companies with more women and their boards of directors tend to have stronger records reducing carbon emissions throughout their value chains. At the other end of the spectrum, in villages throughout the developing world, women are also on the front lines of climate solutions. Let's take energy access as an example. Today, 1.3 billion people in the world still lack access to electricity. At least 2.7 billion people lack access to clean cook stoves and fuels. Uh, how do we make a dent in those numbers? I would suggest that one way is by focusing on women. Today, women are the primary users of technologies like solar lamps and clean cook stoves. They can be the key to increasing small-scale clean technology adoption rates and energy access in communities. Further, women and women's groups can serve as distribution networks to help fill the last mile gap in areas lacking energy access. To harness women's potential to increase energy access, the State Department has launched the Partnership on Women's Entrepreneurship and Renewables, what we call W Power. It seeks to empower women, more than 8,000 women, clean energy entrepreneurs across East Africa, Nigeria, and India to bring clean energy access to more than 3.5 million people over the next three years. This new public-private partnership brings together the MacArthur Foundation, the Global Alliance for Cook Stoves, Care International, Solar Sisters, SSP India, the Wangari Mathai Institute for Peace and Environmental Studies, Women for Women International, and the Green Belt Movement to provide the necessary training, access to clean energy technology inventories, and microfinance loans to women entrepreneurs. We believe that this initiative will not just increase clean energy access, it will also yield a double dividend for families. As you all know, we've heard this many times, studies have shown that women disproportionately spend more of their earned income improving the well-being of their families and their children. By empowering women to become clean energy entrepreneurs, we improve not just their own lives, but that of their families and their communities. We hope to build W Power over the next few years, and we would welcome any new partners who are interested in joining us. When we talk about women on the front lines, we unfortunately also mean the front lines of climate change impacts. Studies show that women and girls in developing countries suffer disproportionately from the effects of extreme weather events, some of which are related to climate change. For example, the people recently or recorded killed by the 1991 cyclone in Bangladesh, more than 90% were women and children. However, studies also show that with progress on education and gender equality around the world, fewer lives are lost from extreme weather events, regardless of the cause. By connecting our investments in climate resiliency and women, we can help increase gender equality and simultaneously decrease climate impacts. Much work remains in these areas and many others I didn't have the chance to touch on today, but the good news is that women are on the front lines of change everywhere. By tapping their potential on climate and energy solutions, we will move closer to a sustainable future for all of us. So thank you all very much for being here. Thank you for what you're doing. I look forward to working with you in the future, and I appreciate your attention. Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador. 
Moving right along, I would like to now, uh, I'm honored to welcome to the podium Senator Jean Shaheen from New Hampshire. She is the only woman in U.S. history to be elected both a governor and a U.S. senator, so a real uh, a beacon of women's leadership here with us today. Uh, she has served in the U.S. Senate since 2009 and is a member of the Senate Committees on Armed Services, Foreign Relations, Appropriations, and Small Business and Entrepreneurship. Senator Shaheen. Thank you very much. It's great to be here with all of you. And Kathy, as you were talking about the impact that women are having um, in their communities, I thought about the recent budget negotiations <laughs> in Congress. And do we think it's a, an accident that we finally got a budget this year with Patty Murray's budget chair, and now we've got an appropriations, omnibus appropriations bill with Barbara Mikulski as uh, appropriations chair? I think there's a connection. <laughs> Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here with all of you, and I want to I want to talk a little bit about what I'm working on in the Senate to address climate change, and um, where what I have looked at, where I think there's the best opportunity to move legislation forward, is around energy efficiency, and it not only I think allows us to leverage public dollars for private investment, as John was talking about, which we know is, is really what we've got to do if we're going to address this issue, and you all are working on that. Um, but it also, by the way, helps with job creation and economic growth. So environment, economy, jobs, and um, national security as well. So we are still in too many areas in the Senate and in Congress fighting the battle of whether climate change is real or not. I don't think anybody who lived through the last week where we saw temperatures go from about 10 below with a wind chill to 60 degrees in a week um, should doubt the fact that something is going on with climate and we need to think about how to address it. When I ran for the Senate in 2008, it's one of the issues that I was really wanted to try and work on when I got to the Senate. And I remember meeting with New Hampshire's Carbon Coalition during that campaign. And one of the things that they showed me is the survey that said that people think there's something going on with climate, but they're not sure what to do about it. And so that's why it's hard to get action. So this session where you all are in a place where you can really make an impact um, on climate is really exciting. And um, I was pleased to see the research that Kathy talked about and that the study that showed that 59 to 34 women are more interested in addressing sustainable investments than men. Um, so I went to Congress, to the Senate, thinking that I was going to be on the Energy Committee, which I was for four years, and I was going to have a real chance to introduce legislation to address climate, and sat through four years on that committee where we had multiple bills. We had a, a sort of omnibus bill in the first two years that was a real climate bill. It wasn't as robust as the House passed on cap and trade, but it was an effort to address many of those issues, worked with John Kerry and Barbara Boxer, and nothing happened. So I got to thinking about how, can, how do we message this issue? How do we work on policy in a way that is going to help us get past um, the climate change deniers that's going to be able to get Republicans and Democrats to come on board. And the key for me to do that is energy efficiency, because it's the cheapest, fastest way to deal with our energy needs. And so Rob Portman, who is um, Republican from Ohio, and I got together at the beginning of the last Congress to work on legislation. And we agreed that one of the things we needed to do is to craft a bill that would be able to actually get through Congress. So to think about how can we do something that may not have a whole lot of money in it, may not have a lot of mandates, you know, it's not going to be cap and trade, it's not going to be a carbon tax, but how can we make progress on this issue? And another lesson for me was we can make a lot of progress incrementally. We don't have to have a magic bullet, and there isn't probably isn't 
a silver bullet to address this issue. But where can we find ways to get agreement to move policy in a way that will leverage those private investments that are so important? And so that's what we did. We came up with a bill, um, the Energy Efficiency and Industrial Competitiveness Act, also known as Shaheen Portman. You know, I like Washington because they name legislation after you. <laughs> so, this never happened in New Hampshire. Um, but it really attempts to do some of those things. It, there are no mandates in the bill. Um, there's not a lot of money in the bill, but it's really designed to try and leverage the private sector in a way that can encourage action that will address climate change, that will address pollution and the environment. And to date, we have over 250 groups and businesses that are supporting the bill, everything from um, the Sierra Club to the Chemical Council. Um, I figure when you get both of those on board for a piece of legislation, you're doing pretty well. It's got the U.S. Chamber, the National Association of Manufacturers, the Natural Resources Defense Fund. Um, and it addresses several of the areas that are most challenging as we look at how can we deal with pollution that affects climate change. One is buildings. Forty percent of our energy use is in buildings. It would strengthen national building codes in a way that's voluntary. Um, it will train the next generation of workers in energy efficient commercial building design and operation through existing university-based centers. Um, it addresses the industrial manufacturing sector, which is the biggest user of energy in our economy. By directing the Department of Energy to work through their advanced manufacturing office with the private sector um, to encourage research and commercialization of new technologies. Um, it helps businesses reduce their energy use by becoming, um, by incentivizing the use of more efficient electric motors. Um, it uses a supply chain um, program that's modeled on um, the Energy Star program. It's called Supply Star to help make companies' supply chains more efficient. And um, I found this one particularly interesting because one of New Hampshire's companies is Stonyfield Yogurt. And they are very interested in sustainable energy investments. And they've, they've done everything they can to make their processes more efficient to, um, from the building that they're in to the manufacturing of the yogurt. And they said when they did that, they studied it and they discovered that um, they were still using a whole lot of energy and they couldn't figure out why. And then they realized that it's because of the cows. The cows where they get the milk, of course, are one of the big producers of methane. And so um, looking at the supply chains and figuring in, out how we can be more efficient is really critical. And then the bill also deals with the federal government and how do we make our energy use in the federal government, which is the biggest user of energy, much more efficient. Um, so we're excited about the bill. We um, think we can actually get it passed. We are um, working with a number of bipartisan sponsors to get new amendments into the legislation that will allow us to get it back to the floor. We were able to get it to the floor back before the government shut down, and uh, thanks to one of the senators who wanted health care votes. We didn't, weren't able to advance it. Um, but we have a real shot, and it will unleash the private sector investments that you all are um, so interested in working on. So thank you very much for everything that you're doing, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you so much, Senator. I think it's clear from uh, the leading voices that we heard from today, both men and women, not just women, uh, how critical this issue is. Um, so thank you very much to our opening speakers. Uh, now I'd like to invite um, Elizabeth Littlefield up to the podium. Uh, Ms. Littlefield was appointed by President Obama as the President and CEO of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, uh, which is the U.S. government's development finance inst institution. Ms. Littlefield. Thanks so much. Um, thanks so much, Ashley. And thanks. It's, it's a real uh, pleasure to see all of you here today. It's kind of daunting because all of you are the leaders that are moving and shaking and, and really advancing the field. 
uh, and it's really just a privilege to be all here. I'm, I'm particularly excited personally to be here in my capacity uh, with OPIC because I actually believe, as do my colleagues at OPIC, that we really are at the point where this is the most predictable and powerful economic transformation that the world has ever seen. The most powerful transformation you know, of our time ever. And how can we not get excited about a transformation that has the potential to change the way the economy is fueled from fundamentally a dirty, polluting, inefficient, expensive, and exclusive way of driving the economy to one that is clean, efficient, modern, cheap, symbiotic and inclusive, um, as well as being an economy that can actually drive wealth and, and, uh, and jobs in a way that a dirty economy can't. So that's the reason that I'm excited about it, and that's the reason that, we're, that we at OPIC are so focused on it. Now, we focus on the international side, on emerging markets, and there, I think, as you all know, it's actually happening more than anywhere else. It's happening in large part because in much of the poor world, the only way that people are going to get energy at all is, is through renewable energy. In many cases, many are off-grid distributed power. I think we know that 50% of the installed capacity last year was finally a renewable. We've seen solar prices coming down, solar panel prices coming down. Wind is following suit. So it's really, it's booming and in, in large part the emerging markets where I have the privilege of having worked most of my career uh, is where it's happening kind of the most. Um, in fact, I'm reminded when I go back to some 20 or 30, oh God, well, the late in the 80s when I was living in Africa at the beginning of my career, I lived in a house, a little hut, uh, for 18 months that had no running water and no electricity except for one or two hours a day, and that was between one and two in the morning because my particular village wasn't very politically connected, so our slot on the load shedding uh, cycle was one to three a.m. And I lived like that for for for, uh, for a year and a half, so I, I have a sense a sense of what it's all about. But let's come to as, since we're here talking about emerging markets, at least that's my role here, and talking about OPEC too. Um, let's talk a little bit about Africa. Um, I think you all know that Africa has unbelievably abundant renewable energy, right? 325 days a year of sun. There's plenty of wind in the west. Uh, in the east, you have hydropower. You know, throughout. So Eastern and Central Europe, Rwanda, Tanzania, the DRC, plentiful hydropower. I think we've all heard of Inga Dam and the potential that Inga has. But geothermal as well, all along the Rift Valley, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Uganda. There's a huge amount of renewable energy available in that continent. And yet, a quarter of the people in Africa, only a quarter, have access to power. You compare that to Asia, where it's 60% of the people in East Asia and South Asia have access, and in the Middle East and North Africa and Latin America, it's over 90% have access to power. So only a quarter of the people in Africa have power. Now think about the fact that this is the fastest growing economy taken as a whole in the world. These countries are growing at 5 and 6% a year, and yet the power capacity is only growing at 1% a year. So you've got this incredible growth in demand, and yet down here is the growth in, in supply of power. That's a crisis waiting to happen, and the only solution for that crisis is clearly renewable energy, and particularly, I think, off-grid uh, distributed power. Just, but let's just, we all talk about a thousand, you know, a quarter of the world's po African population has no access to power. We all know what that means, but let's just think about what that means, a quarter of these people have access to power. That means that 600 million people on the continent of Africa have no access to any power whatsoever. That's the entire population times two of the United States with no access to the ability to open a fridge or flip on a light switch. You know, these are people that are learning, teaching themselves, uh, having babies, cooking, cleaning, washing with no access to power whatsoever. And remember that this is people that have every bit the human potential of you and me, but they're not realizing it because they don't have the basic things that we take so for granted. Sorry, I can get very passionate about this, but I'm getting off my talking points, so I will come back. Um, so all of this uh, Africa I speak of, in, in particular, it, it's obviously the most acute case, but this is the backdrop for Power Africa and why I'm so grateful that the president has chosen to make Power Africa his signature international development initiative for his second term. Um, and we're very privileged at OPIC to be a key participant uh, in Power Africa. We've uh, agreed to contribute one and a half billion dollars, which I think we can make pretty easily, uh, to the seven billion dollar initiative. 
uh, and we're very proud to be a key part along with uh, AID, who's coordinating the effort, and, and the White House and, and others. Oh, sorry, I should mention Power Africa, but also there's, even though Senator Shaheen is gone, there's also a, a companion bill, as you may know, of Electrify Africa. I hope they changed the name. Uh, Electrify Africa, which always sounds a little painful to me. I hear the name is going to change uh, in the Senate and the House, which takes the pres President's Power Africa bill and actually even extends it with even bolder um, ambitions. So this brings me to OPEC, and I've asked to speak a little bit about OPEC and what we've been doing uh, in the renewable energy space since we are convinced this is the most powerful and predictable transformation of our generation. Um, so OPEC, as Ashley said, is the, is the U.S. government's development finance institution. Um, it's our role in life to help catalyze and stimulate private capital flows in the service of development uh, in emerging markets countries. Um, and we do that by providing the kinds of tools that will reduce risks and create incentives for investments to flow towards development in emerging markets. Tools like long-term uh, long financing, like political risk insurance, like guarantees, and like uh, support for private equity funds. So, in, and I can't resist the temptation since the budget's coming out uh, this evening to point out that we're actually development that pays for itself. We generate uh, tax revenue every single year for the taxpayer last year on our $17 billion portfolio, we generated about $425 million in revenues. It goes straight back to, uh, to, to the Treasury. This is a town where you can't not say that every chance you get. So, um, so when I joined uh, OPIC uh, in 2010, just a couple of years ago, we decided to choose, choose one sector priority and one regional priority. The regional priority is lower income countries, ergo, my focus on Africa, and our one sectoral priority is renewable resources. Now within that, of course, renewable energy is the, is the easiest thing to finance commercially. So despite our interest in water and agriculture and forestry and ecosystems and, and species, we're, we're very focused on uh, renewable energy. Um, now you might say, so we've set this as a priority, but we're totally demand driven. Um, you know, we're a bank, we're an insurance company, we're an investment bank. How do we decide which way we're going to go unless clients want that? Well, we've found that clients do want it. And the fact that we've seen our numbers grow incredibly quickly is evidence of the latent demand there is for uh, financing for renewable energy projects in emerging markets. For example, we have started in 2008, we were doing around $10 million in renewable energy financing a year. Fine. 2009, we grew it to, it was $100 million. 2010, 300 million, and 2011, 12, and 13, we've been around a billion dollars a year in renewable energy in some of the poorest countries in the world. We've done big utility scale geothermal in Kenya. We've done hydropower in the country of Georgia. We've done wind farms in Latin America and Peru and Chile and St. Kitts. Uh, we've done big uh, utility scale biofuel, in fact, in Pakistan and Liberia. Um, as well as a lot of distributed power, solar, and other uh, big solar, actually, utility scale in Latin America as well. So all over the world, both utility and, and small scale, we've been doing, again, to, to the tune of about a billion plus a billion plus a year. In fact, we're very proud, uh, John Podesta mentioned earlier, Fast Start, and we're very proud that even though we're a small but vital agency, we were able to contribute about a, a quarter of the full U.S. commitment under the Copenhagen uh, Fast Start commitments, which I think is something that we're very proud of. Um, so, okay, just one last thing, and maybe we can come to this if we have a chance for questions and answers. In addition to the volumes, which we're proud of, we've actually focused on trying to design specific products that address the gaps in the market. Like, for example, we've designed a feed-in tariff insurance product that will cover the risks of changes to the feed-in tar tariff, which we think is a, a lot of the basis for which investors are making some investments in emerging markets, the feed-in tariffs. We've also designed things like subordinated debt for energy efficiency in an ESCO-like product, uh, leasing products for renewable energy, uh, renewable energy products in emerging markets where it's too expensive to buy the stuff. And frankly, for me, one of the most powerful and simple tools, which is a one-page piece of paper, which we hope will get many logos on it, including GEFs, um, that has the 10 elements of a bankable PPA, which we hope will help bridge the trust gap between developers and countries that can cost six, nine months of negotiating just when everyone can agree that these are the things that PPA needs to be bankable. So as I close, um, after saying that, and again, I welcome your questions and thoughts on that, I'd say that we have a, a number of projects, of course, that f are focused on women, women as clients, uh, access to finance projects, many loan guarantee funds where we've created added incentives, additional guarantee le levels for banks that will lend to women-owned businesses, for example. 
And in our client base, we're very proud to count really powerful women leaders in this front, working at the frontier in emerging markets. April Alderdice, who at Microenergy Credits is bundling and microenergy uh, credits at the microfinance level to, to get carbon credits to, to subsidize the cost of those acquisitions. Uh, Dita Bronitsky, the CEO of Ormat, who's been a real big investor at the frontier. Uh, so these are, these are women clients that we count among our best. But I'd like to just, in speaking about women leaders, I've got one, one, one just one minute. Um, I'd like to just recognize some very influential women uh, in the administration who have been very powerful, Nancy Sutley, Heather Zeichel, who are here, Michelle Patron, as well as uh, Jessica Brown, who's been a very powerful partner to us in Todd Stern's office. So just as I wrap up, I'd like to say, I, just, I actually just got back from an incredibly powerful trip to Liberia, where a country that had 500 megawatts of power before the Civil War has got 20 megawatts of installed capacity now. In a country of four and a half million people, there's only 12,000 grid connections in the whole country. And there I spent the day with the first female head of state elected, the first you know, female ambassador, a female econ officer, and two female entrepreneurs as we looked at building out uh, distributed energy uh, facilities throughout that country. So as we think about mitigation and adaptation, and we think about the north and the south, we think about supply and demand, I would just leave you with, and we'll talk about the US too, just I, I would implore you to think about the fact that the power usage in emerging markets is very low. In Haiti, the average person is using the equivalent of one laptop per annum in power. And in Ethiopia, it's one US coffee maker per person per annum. So let's think about that balance as we think about going forward these, these solutions for, for climate and women's role in it, because women get that imbalance better than anyone. So thanks very much. Thanks. for just a couple of questions, and I'm afraid we'll have to use this uh, standing mic here because we aren't able to have roving mics in this room. So if you could, uh, maybe two folks, if you have questions, step up to the standing mic there. Okay, just one. Hello, thank you for your remarks Hi. and for holding this event today. My name is Robin Brown from Rockefeller and Company. And I'm just um, interested in your comments on the opportunity for renewables in places like Africa and how that fits into the context of um, providing access to electricity to people who don't currently have it. And in, in referencing that, I'm thinking, um, can you provide any insight on your, uh, your thoughts on how um, the deployment of renewable electricity may help to offset climate change as we increase access to electricity for people who are underserved while considering the fact that by providing renewables uh, in these places it might help to uh, leapfrog these, these countries in avoiding the need for fossil fuels and the deployment of power grids that they don't currently have. Yeah, um, thank, thanks very much for that question. No, I appreciate that because, you know, oftentimes I think we all hear that in Africa, you know, poor people shouldn't be forced to take renewable energy, we shouldn't apply our standards to them because it's so expensive. Well, it's not more expensive. It's actually cheaper. It's getting cheaper all the time, and frankly, it's particularly cheap. When you look at the alternatives for many African families, the three quarters that have no access, their alternative is to flying in diesel on prop planes to run a generator. I mean, solar's got to be easier than that, right? So it's actually a benchmark that's not hard to beat. And actually, I've just, so leapfrogging is not going to, not, is, is, is clearly happening in the continent, just like we're leapfrogging on Afri in Africa over you know, check cashing systems and, and other things with mobile banking. But I also would just point to the fact that many African uh, countries and, and, and those in other parts of the world, I think are very enlightened in their renewable energy policy. I mean, you look at South Africa, which put in place one of the most aggressive and progressive uh, renewable energy policies and programs a couple of years ago, they've got plenty of coal. They've got coal that'll last them 50 years, and yet they're, they're aiming on putting 17,000 megawatts of renewable energy, why? Because, first of all, they've only got 50, 50 years worth of coal. Second of all, they want to be at the forefront of this industry because they too think it's one of the biggest economic transformations of our time. They want their people to be part of that, uh, part of that industrial growth and part of that economy. And also because they care about pollution and climate. So, I mean, for Af South Africa to be at the forefront of that when they've got plenty of uh, fossil fuels, I think, is indicative of what's sweeping the rest of the continent. And, and you know, we've seen, what, 150 countries throughout the world have renewable energy programs, and 130 or so of them have uh, feed-in tariffs or, or some equivalent to that. 
So I think countries throughout the world are picking this up, and, I, and I'm optimistic about their being in the leadership role. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Lorena Aguilar. I work for IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Gender Issues. And we're trying to build knowledge on the gender criteria for big energy projects and what they should be, because we're very good at linking gender and energy at small scale. But what happened with the big projects? What are the gender criteria? And if you have any of those, we'll love to hear some of those from you. You know, I would probably defer to others in the room that, that know the gender issues um, as they relate to environment uh, more, probably more deeply than I do, actually. I'm sort of daunted about speaking about these issues in front of all of you. I would just say, I came from the microfinance space. And you know, in the microfinance world, I, th I see some friends that were there and 20 years ago in the microfinance world. You know, in the beginning, everyone in the conference rooms, everyone at the conferences and the, and the gatherings were all women. And then, you know, it got sexy, it got hot, <laughs> and it got successful, and it got profitable, and it was starting to work. And then next thing you know, it's women are, women are the minority in those rooms these days. So I think the fact that we have a good gender balance in the renewable energy sector probably is a leading indicator that the sector's here to stay. Right. Thank you so much. Thanks.